So now uh, I just had the interview with Marcin and now is Franz here, uh, my friend and the one who also introduced uh, us each other uh, 15 or 20 years ago. And uh, yeah, Franz, I also had the pleasure to interview you three years ago or so for, for the summit. Was 19 for years. A visionary uh, for um, yeah, global uh, globally integrated villages. Um, well, yeah, and we have already started a little discussion already. And so I just throw the ball to you to see where we uh, pick it up. Okay, I was I was following... because Franz said I have a thousand questions. <laughs> <laughs> I was following this discussion as a silent listener, I'm enormously privileged to be the first person <laughs> participating in the Congress, so to say. Um, yeah, and uh, and of course, uh, since Martian and I, we have been in touch uh, all the time, uh, again and again, and I follow this development closely, uh, and uh, um, I am feeling that. Uh, we are inspiring each other and uh, I, I think global village construction set has something to do with uh, the the notion that we can decentralize that we can form new kinds of social covenants and new kinds of uh, living spaces communal living spaces which are characterized by a high degree of of self-reliance and autarky and uh, we maybe can bring down uh, uh, two complex uh, social uh, uh, sh should i say over developments to uh, to a sound level which is still technologically very sophisticated but is working uh, in a in a circular locally integrated way so that's uh, and that uh, is uh, in in a positive feedback loop with global cooperation and knowledge exchange. So to say, the idea of global villages is that uh, we create a globe of villages. We create by our cooperation uh, a world in which we have much more possibility uh, and a, a much bigger array of possibilities locally. Uh, at the at the uh, parochial level, so to say, at the at the at the neighborhood level, the neighborhood level will be a, a very interesting place to live. Uh, we had this uh, this this wonderful uh, essay of Wendell Berry just in the in the New Yorker, where he is talking about this uh, rural America being destroyed by industrial agriculture. Martian, are you here? <laughs> don't see you. I don't know what happened there. I Okay. Bumped out. Okay. Here we are again. So this uh, yeah. this is uh, this is really something. Uh, it's a challenge to industrial agriculture as well. I think uh, we are we're talking about a way um, that, uh, as Fridtjof Bergman, uh, Ma Martin mentioned the name, and uh, Fridtjof, he's always known for his very <laughs> strong uh, words and formulations and. One time he wrote me, I want to find a new a catchphrase to catch them all. And as you talked about, so Fritjof said, let's all become farmers again. Uh, what do you think about that? Mm -hmm. And I said, wonderful, Fritjof, but you have to expand the concept of farmers. Farming is not just creating uh, 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 crops on the land. It's it's creating herbs. It's creating energy. It's creating uh, raw materials for local production. It is it is it is. Uh, is I want to uh, ask you to become more concise. Otherwise, we have uh, yeah. enough so, time. No, but that, that's the background <laughs> I needed to give. So, so uh, we have this this shift in what farming means, what the relationship to the land means, and. Uh, and now I see that uh, you're doing this second step after the tractor, the house. It is like uh, the, the, the next big threshold uh, that you cross. Uh, uh, the tractor was relating to the land. The, the house is inhabiting the land. And the next next thing will be the village. The next thing will be how to put, to put the houses together. And then again, uh, in which relation do these houses uh, exist in relation, for example, to existing cities? Are we just a kind of suburbia or are we in a productive relation with the cities? We had a, uh, excuse me, Martin, I have to. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, really. 
We had a we had a meeting with uh, Fab City Hamburg. Uh, now maybe France, you, you give the two the board to Martin now and then again back to you. Is, okay. Because, yeah. Okay. Martin is the is the is the person to be in the <laughs> center. Yeah. Questions. Well, let me just tell you one thing that sticks out for because this is kind of like the the summary of the last decade or two of learnings. But one learning, interestingly, is that the idealists. So. What's the role of the idealist? We're all idealists here, but the thing that we found out, it's like, man, it takes hard work. Like in the first apprenticeship uh, on the ho house, there were six people here and turned out none of them wanted to put in the heart, four of them, <clears throat> most of them, let's say, were not interested in the hard physical work that's part of this game. It's like, that's understandable, but it's like, who's gonna do it, right? So. Right now, I don't expect the idealists to, to make the change. If we talk about the house, for example, it's like, this is your common man. It's actually, we're, we're actually shifting back to the common man, <laughs> like reconnecting to, okay, those are the people, like it takes everybody. And it's, I common found- Man and woman, let's say, please. Man and woman, <laughs> yeah. Um, I found that a lot of the idealists uh, just don't have the grit or commitment to do this, which is like, wow. Um, I thought that would be the source of that, of the, of the revolution, but no, it's, uh, mm. does that make sense that if we're going to change the world, like, like for France, for example, right now, you, you, I still hear you talking about all the enlightened people. We're going to make these communities happen, blah, blah, blah. I'm finding that we're shifting. It's like in the basic design of how we roll this out, the customer is going to be the the common person, the common man. It's it's not going to be like the elites like us. We can you know we can instigate some of it, but the people who who are really going to be the productive forces, that's going to be the average people who have the grunt jobs today. I think that's my opinion on that right now. Like in the house building crew. Uh, I think a lot of people are going to be the people who can swing a hammer as opposed to write a computer program. Uh, I, absolutely. But but here yeah. again, let me give you another catchphrase. What you have just introduced, uh, what you're just going to do right now, build a house with about 20 people in five days. It's a kind yeah. of modern equivalent to the Amish barn raising. Yeah. It's a kind of uh, community effort. You need to uh, you need to have a kind of community yeah. arrangement with that. That's mm -hmm. that's very interesting for me because you have to consider next time uh, we build the second person's house and so on and so on and so on. It's a kind of gift economy which could which could emerge yeah. here. It lends itself to that. However, the initial business model will rely on twenty four skilled people who we train. We can get to the barn raising everybody in the community stage, not in the initial phase. So this is tactical operations here, not in the initial phase like I thought. That works to a certain limit. It will work after we perfect the model that we can actually do that as this edutainment and community production experience that's also still production. Now, um, to the point that take a ghetto block in Kansas City, we take a thousand of the local people like, real, this is talking for real. The black community, redlined, who's faced the oppression of the man through <laughs> through history. We can now go in and say, uh, not like top down, like, like the white man going into Africa, but we can come in and provide the skills and the ability to take an entire block and reinvigorate it in like a weekend or a month. And have it affordable enough that this actually works as a revenue, as a business model, that it's replicable. That's the power. That's the modern digital barn raising of the Amish applied to like social good today. I'm very optimistic about it. So that swarm building capacity can become huge. That, that can be a big, big part. We are building that as part of the options that we have. We're building the options, say for the house building as, okay, here's a standard business model for commercial production. And here's a community-based building model as well. Yeah. Okay, next step. What's the rationale of the village? Let me give you an example. Uh, last week we had uh, this wonderful uh, discussion at Fab City Hamburg with mm -hmm. Hans Wittmer of Glomo. 
And he's, uh, he's developing a model of so-called global modules of co-living. And uh, one of the elements of this model is very interesting, is a relation between an urban block and a rural, like yeah. say 80 hectare community village. So I yeah. think that's a that's a wonderful idea to have this uh, to have this uh, we have it already in Vienna as a community supported agriculture, yeah. but they want to expand it to a kind of sort of uh, relation between uh, a district a neighborhood and uh, the district is a productive district within the city and there yeah. is a there is a there is a sister community outside the city. So I talked. I said to them, please talk to Ralph Otterpol. He has developed this concept of garden ring villages around cities. And it's a revolutionary concept because it really creates a circular economy and life circumstances and the base of life for people. They can, they can live together in the rural communities and in a very productive exchange with urban uh, course. So what do you think about that? How can we do that in the United States? You can do the same thing or you can go a step further into the further integration take even the 40 acres like okay there was a on the highway right here there's like six hundred thousand dollars get you like i don't know like i think it was like 20 acres right there i could do that i could do an agri hood micro factory and this so yeah you can go i believe in a more the integration route like the cities, the urban environment and the countryside, at the end of the day, they could be like the same. They're, they're, they're going to be more like, say, uh, Seattle, like out there on the West Coast, where the, the communities there, there's much more nature and trees. And it's almost like if you can combine the two. I, I like either option. It's like you can like Asia, a, like Asia. They, they have this model in uh, Malaysia, wherever you have. You, you don't actually cannot tell city from countryside in, in large yeah, districts. Why not? I mean, open up all the different options of how to do this. Like we don't have to have, I think the, the city, the very concentrated city with, with the big skyscrapers is also a manifestation of the centralization. But what if even you had that model like that with the sky, skyscrapers that grow food with extremely efficient production, stuff like that. So I see like this total blend. I don't see like all this dichotomy between the city and country that can be integrated through very smart design. Yeah, that's um, that's probably the next step uh, that we have to think about. And uh, if we do not give an answer to this uh, question, how we actually how we actually uh, make use of that potential abundance around us, and how mm -hmm. we reorganize social life, uh, we will fall back into these patterns uh, yeah. of uh, of aggression and war and dominance and control uh, that we are currently uh, so painfully experiencing. Yeah, and I mean, what I mentioned about the ghetto block in Kansas City, I'm not just, uh, you know, getting crazy ideas. Out. I mean, there's whole blocks where there's maybe like a couple of houses on the whole block. It's run down. Take that, rebuild community. Might as well build, you know, take the block next door or a few blocks, create integrated garden space or or edible, edible landscape or whatever, aquaponics. I mean, you can have PV production. You can have a solar hydrogen station that takes an acre. And that could be like whatever your food store, whatever. I mean, just total integration from net present solar income. Even a, like I just went through the numbers, like even an acre, I believe that an acre hydrogen, you got an acre of PV with a hydrogen station underneath from that one acre of PV. That could be an economic model too, pending open source technology that's low cost enough to, to get that hydrogen and all that. There's missing parts like where are you going to get hydrogen cars? Uh, how are you going to have these high pressure compressors that are not really available off the shelf today? The PV is PV is like 30 cents a watt right now, but crazy stuff that can happen on any scale. That's that's the future, and we can start injecting that right now. We say we um, so right now we we're at a place where we've got land for four houses like right now today we can build. Hey, what what can we build there? I don't know. Well, that's limited space. But next next is we'll get, we'll snap up an a uh, you know a block. So that's the next level. That's so right now we're mastering the house level, and then it's going to be the com whole community. So, but the the cool thing would be if absolutely open source. Once again, the affordances of open technology. If this is open, the model, the social and enterprise model, is open around that. That can scale to what we call distributed market substitution, 
if you France, if you heard that word. That means basically all the common goods that are out there are being replaced by distributed open source variants, distributed Wonderful. market substitution for everything. Wonderful. Let me give you a model which is now very close to my heart. Um, I just created a radio program on that, uh, and uh, and it's something that I think is is one of the most interesting differences between uh, America and Europe. Uh, in in the USA, you have these big retirement communities. So old people, uh, like the villages in Florida, with two hundred thousand people, oh, yeah. or Sun City in uh, Arizona with 130,000 people. And uh, yeah. if they have enough money, they, there is a big industry backing that up. Uh, but uh, uh, I think uh, Europeans would not like that. They don't want to be separated from the younger generations. So uh, for example, uh, can we offer another solution where we integrate the generations and we have, uh, we have livable circumstances yeah. with a lot of care for the elderly? Yeah, yeah. In principle, the wise, the the older you get, the wiser you're supposed to get and stuff. So there could be good interaction between young and old people. Uh, I mean, yeah, absolutely. You're just, you're saying the you know the obvious. Yeah, this this would be good. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Now, how to do it? How to do it? Now that's called movement entrepreneurship. So I think the way the OSE, um, and Martin, Martin, the way you also frame it about upskilling people and social entrepreneurship. Well, movement entrepreneurship, that's the social open source entrepreneurship where you start by saying, okay, what are important questions that we need to answer? And let's start training ourselves to answer them. That's the vision for OSE. The, the campus for OSE would be, okay, you train people to do that. You give them this, this, the tools to solve problems, to be collaboratively literate and technologically literate to actually execute and then enterprise savvy, which is that missing piece that most idealists hmm. are missing out on, right? Hmm. So yeah, this, uh, the future is bright. <laughs> uh, one yeah. last question, uh, yes. because it's so politically hot. Yeah, oh. you, you mentioned uh, the uh, book, uh, it seems you read that book at least, uh, or you, you, you dived into uh, the network state by Shunavasa. Uh, uh, the the one that you that you mentioned. I I, I want to learn about it. What did you? Oh, take you haven't from heard? It? No, I haven't. But Shame I'm going on to you. read immediately. I I'm going you to read immediately after our talk <laughs> uh, because it's exactly the one thing that I was thinking about today: how we can create an international cooperative a cooperative of regenerative areas. You know how we can can we create a a, a, a global covenant of those. Who, who really have to support each other to make that thing uh, sustainable. So mm -hmm. what, what, what can you tell us about this uh, idea oh, of the network state yeah. besides, the, besides the, 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 the currency question, which I'm not really interested in, but uh, the, the, the political and the, and the administrative uh, side of things? What, what, what would right. you say? Right. Uh, so, so you haven't heard of it because it was published in 2021, perhaps, uh, but it is, uh, I think, the continuation of our work. It's, it's exactly what we're talking about. It's, you have to, end of the end of the day, work out some kind of an op operational model or revenue model or whatever you call it. Like the business guys, he, he's a business guy, so he, called, uh, he would talk about revenue models. And I, I talk a lot about revenue models these days, too, right? Um, but the social contract is something that no one has figured out yet because nobody has done that, right? Close maybe some, some intentional communities, but the shortcoming of most intentional communities is the economic base. Um, the intentional communities are a lot, a lot for the escapists who have already worked out their economic base and then that's their next step, like me or you. <laughs> Right, um, but how do you make it a viable community that more people can join? Now, the good thing, so the network state, the idea is, yeah, it's a global village, but they start organizing online around some common interest. That's the way he talks about. It. So yeah, it could be whatever interest that is. Yeah, it it's creating be. resonance, and resonance is leading yeah. to physical places. Yes, exactly. Now. How do you actually then crowdsource real estate or productive capacity? It could be a bunch of islands, 
maybe it's constellations maybe there's one agglomeration where it's you know it's more more mass it could be a single house in a city with you know a few houses but because of the blockchain now you can keep records and contracts and like the economic engine which is i mean what's what's the blockchain it's transparent accounting right so they're basically saying that now that you have the technology of transparent accounting you can create organizations on any scale it no longer needs to be a landmass it can start as an idea and then because you have the means to to manage it in a decentralized decentralized way through the blockchain meaning a simply all we're saying is a transparent ledger of accounting uh, so it's not anarchy uh, not necessarily autarky because it's global collaborative right i i don't like when i look at the word autarky or self-sufficiency actually i noticed that the other day i i, I don't want to use the words i want to say um for either like interdependence collaboration or maybe that word that i didn't like before the financial independence mm. that, i didn't like that word before but 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 that's really what the mainstream means by like when we talk about um like freedom or whatever like a lot of people know that as financial independence if we want to talk to the mainstream world so okay. so now these days a lot of times i talk about uh, like, i i i, I, I read you I hear you. Right. Uh, yeah. uh, there was uh, there was a conference almost exactly one year ago. What's called the Rebuild Conference, uh, yeah. which was a groundbreaking mm -hmm. event. Uh, and uh, it, what I what I learned in this conference is that there is a, a vast community of digital nomads around the globe. So they are very fluid people. They are uh, they are traveling around the world, and they are looking for settlement. They're really looking for places where they can work and live in the optimum way. A lot of them are right now in Portugal. Uh, and uh, they started the Village 3.0 movement uh, and, and other similar movements and places. So I think it's, 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 it's very interesting to see if this culture of uh, global nomadism can link to this, uh, to this development of global villages. Yeah, and my first red flag on it, I've got a big red flag, and that's 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 beyond creative digital work. You have to skill the them's people up. And my learning from our experience in OSE has been that those are not the clients that uh I mean my my feeling on that is is kind of like uh a little negative on that in the sense that it's like make sure that they, they can um uh, produce physical things. Maybe. because then you're going to end up like maybe with, uh, maybe anarchy. martian it's maybe it's a prejudice but uh we're going to publish this little bonus track <laughs> and we're no, going to bring I mean, it to a lot I'm, of I'm people's just saying, attention just saying this is this is the reality my finding has been is that my hope was that the idealists would, would have the super grit and the the actually the physical work which is different than the creative work my finding has been that not a lot of the, the same clientele has that so if you do create the digital nomad community make sure that there's a means that the physical reality is taken care of and not more like permaculture that then you then you starve and then go back to the city like that kind of thing you know make sure it's there make sure it's there i just see the reality i've seen terror happen on this place here when I mean, we were a complete example of such anarchy. It's like people come here in droves and then everyone goes back to the city to work for the man because we haven't built the economic engines. Mm. And if, yeah, you can be a you know, cultural creative, uh, the creative class, the digital nomad, but that's operating, that's not operating in a physical economy, which, which is still 80% of the economy. It's very yeah, interesting. I, uh, I, I have a different perspective. I see that these cultures, they are, they are almost uh, magnetically attracted by each other in the moment. But that is are. the beauty that we have different perceptions and maybe we can enrich each other in that way. Yeah. Uh, tell me what's, what you see on the other side. Like, do you see, uh, uh, see hope? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, of course I see hope, but I'm just saying that's a thing that has not been resolved. Like, I don't know the answer to that yet. 
Yeah. I can tell you that we will have an answer, i.e. we will have productive nodes that, oh yeah, now you can on your cell phone down, download your micro factory and actually have it built for you by robots. Yeah, but we're not there yet. And these <laughs> people think we have that already. That's the yeah. issue I'm trying to address. <laughs> okay. okay. Do you have an answer to that right now? Right now, I have uh, to say that there is hope. There are examples, and we will show them. Uh, uh, we yeah. have this Facebook group, Global Villages Network, and so on, where we are exactly yeah. at that point. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just saying that's the next step. And for me to, to, to get very interested in that, I need to hear those people talk open hardware and licenses and product development. <laughs> that's when I'd be very interested. Okay. Thank you, Martin. And revenue models yep. that, that can <laughs> provide for the sufficiency of those villages, like neo subsistence style, and, and be useful to other people too. Because most likely initially you cannot, you have to trade, you probably won't trade. So you have to trade with the outside community. So you have to make products that the outside communities can understand. That's, that's my reality check for the moment in the world of open source hardware. <laughs> <laughs> Pragmatism yeah. is important. Vision is important as is <laughs> yeah. important too. Okay. So we have yeah. uh, not to drop one side for the other. Okay. Yeah. Martin, thank you very much. Martin, thank you very much. I think yeah. uh, um, I, I would really like to immediately publish this little track. Oh, please. If this, if this is uh, uh, as, a, as a kind of advertisement for uh, Martin's uh, upcoming Congress on encouragement. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so yeah. probably he will agree with that. Yes. Well, okay. it was such a pleasure to listen to you and to see the sparks uh, of vision and well and, and perspectives which are grounded in experience. So I'm so so grateful. It was uh, a great entertainment <laughs> and also nourishing on many levels uh, for me. And I hope also that yeah. other people can take something out of it. Absolutely. So and my, my conclusion. Well, Mike, just one one statement here. Yeah, my conclusion is that we're going to leave the dark ages of open hardware together collaboratively and soon yes <laughs> well thank you so much Martin, for your time thank you yeah, yeah it was a pleasure okay. all, thank all you. the best for uh, you in the wild wild west <laughs> okay thank you <laughs> thank you yes and hope to see you again one day in <laughs> austria I hope hope to hug you yes yeah. yeah yeah hope That's to hug you time. yeah okay <laughs> all right all right bye bye bye, -bye. Dear viewers, thank you all for watching. Uh, if you feel like this uh, short video has provoked you to uh, engage in some kind of discussion, I would cordially invite you to my Facebook group, Global Villages Network. And also thanks to Martin, who has created this opportunity for the interview I would like to point the German speakers to the upcoming Pioneers of Change Summit from 9th to 21st of March 2023 with 33 amazing people, 50,000 participants and a lot of food for thoughts. Bye.